three, two, one, zero, zero, and lift off. Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Designs podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2008, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. Hey everybody, welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's official podcast for everything branding, marketing, and entrepreneurship, where we respect the grind and we reclaim the American dream. I am your host, Ramon Peralta from Peralta Design, and I am joined today by my co-host, Jorge Peso Candelario, and we launch brands. And today, we are so thrilled to have a special guest that's just... uh, inspiring and educating and innovating uh, and, and just making the world a better place everywhere she goes. The Dr. Kelly Page, welcome to Mission Control. Thank you so much, Roman and Jorge. How are you? Thank you for yes. having me. Yes, thank you for being here. And this excited is, to have you here. It, it's wild, Jorge, because she, uh, Dr. Kelly right now is a active we're in the middle of a web launch. So mm-hmm. this is, this is, this is quite wild that, I mean, this may, this may just turn into a working meeting and we're just going to record it. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. But uh, Kelly, tell us, tell us, uh, give us the, your, your elevator pitch, who you are and, and maybe a little bit about how you got started in this, in this realm. All right. So real, I'll be as quick as I can because I'm getting on in years. So therefore, you know, there's a lot to include, but um So I'm a social design ethnographer, if you want to go formal. Uh, What does that mean? That means I study people on culture and especially around technology and how we can design uh, interfaces, uh, experiences where technology is integrated as part of the culture. It's part of what we do. Uh, And I study, yes, the social environment, social people. Um, Currently, I am director of Bennett Labs at Bennett Day School, which is an independent progressive school in Westtown, Chicago. They're a fantastic organization that is looking at the social design of school differently. And so when I met the team, the founding team, Kate Kelly and Cameron Smith last year, it was like just like a match made in heaven because they're very much looking at education through multiple different lenses to sort of go, how can we do school differently? Uh, so for us, when COVID hit, you know, it meant a lot of change, um, but we could innovate. But my background, uh, early days of web design, I remember my f- coding my first website back when, oh gosh, I aged myself. Um, <laughs> back in, I think it was 1996 is when I first started playing with code and was introduced at college to uh, this thing called hypertext markup language, you know, and it blew me away because I could see you could build worlds, right? Digital worlds uh, with this la- these languages. So, um, yeah, my digital experience goes way back, but I'm always interested in how people interact with it. And so over the years, I've worked for large businesses, uh, Fortune 500 companies to small startups. Uh, my heart is in education and learning, um, but I believe every organization is a learning organization. It's not just schools and universities. Uh, yet that's where I often find myself in how can we design school differently and especially how we're using digital and innovative um, methods. So that's a little bit. And obviously I'm not from here, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) And we love that. And actually I want to talk a little bit about that because Americans, you know, we get a, we get a bad rap when we travel because we just think the the world revolves around us, you know, uh, growing up in Australia. Yeah. Tell me a bit about the educational system. Like, how did you come up in, into this field and, and what's schooling like there? Because Americans seem to think that we're the center of everything, you know, uh, technology or intellectual. And it's not the case. Australia, obviously, is producing great talent. Yeah. So Australia is really unique uh, in the sense we borrow from the British system. We borrow from the American system. Mm -hmm. You know, um, obviously, way back when we were colonized uh, by the British, uh, yet if you look at our schooling, uh, we don't have the private system of schooling like you have here in America. We do have some private schools, 
Mm. I think we have two private universities. So our education, one across the board is public. Um, and so, and it's a combination of publicly funded and fee paying. Um, but it is far more accessible than I would say education here is in America for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also it's very different in the sense where, you know, we have surfing as a sport. You know, we have entrepreneurship and, you know, there was entrepreneurship at school when I was there. And so it's, we're very, um, innovative entrepreneurial peoples and I think because we're so young as a country like 220 years old or what have you and so um, we have this kind of attitude and culture as well in Australia it's called a mateship culture right Uh, and the word mate is is it's non-gendered and it is literally everyone's a friend and you look after your friends and you give you know you support your friends and so there's this whole thing of just giving things a go and, uh, you know, more often than not, you can reach out to someone to ask them for advice. And so there's this real open, supportive culture. So schooling for me, um, my mother is a teacher, public school, English, French and history teacher. My father, a truck driver. So, you know, we had exposure to multiple different aspects. You know, my dad ran his own business and my mom did the books on the side. So, mm-hmm. you know, really learning in Australia um, to you have to get in and, you know, get stuff done. Um so it's really entrepreneurial. And our schooling, though, it's interesting. We learn all about British history. We learn all about European history. We learn all about American history. And because uh, we have such, you know, uh, we've borrowed from so many different cultures. And one thing people don't realize about Australia is we're one of the most multicultural countries on earth. I was going to say the Aborigines. So, oh, right? yeah, I mean, the indigenous, you know, uh, the culture of the indigenous peoples. It's like when you learn about it and everything from the way, so there are nomadic peoples as well. So they don't settle spaces. They don't own the land. That's not how they see it. Mm-hmm. And so it's such a beautiful culture to be part of and to have part of your country, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then over those 200 years, whether it be from Southeast Asia, whether it be from Europe, um, Melbourne is regarded as um, the second largest Greek capital outside Athens, you know, because of we are so, we have an open door policy to some degree, right, when it comes to different cultures and people. So I think growing up, um, yeah, education was more accessible. Uh, Mm -hmm. Learning is a very hands-on approach to learning as well, getting in, getting Mm -hmm. it done, giving it a go, uh, or having a go mate is usually what we say. (laughs) It's like... Um, but yeah, so very different. So for me, I was also very fortunate to um, stumble upon an interest in technology. And um, I worked in market research for a number of years as a early in my early 20s. And in Australia as well, our graduate programs, if you want to go on and do a PhD, it's very affordable. So it's, uh, which is a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. It's, our Australian government actually um, uh, pays universities for every PhD they graduate. Wow. So as opposed to it being something that, so therefore for me to go and through my PhD, I got a scholarship, but I also um, was partially government funded. And the, that money goes to my department and my school at the university. Um, and it's to reward research. So they invest in research. Uh, so uh, my PhD was actually half corporate sponsored and half government sponsored um, to be able to do it. So if there's any learning since I've been in America now, nine years, um, I really think to disrupt education, whether that be K-12 or universities, we have to look at the funding models. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the business model of school Mm -hmm. and go, hmm, why is it based on property taxes? Uh, In Australia, it's not. In Australia, there is a, you know, we have a um, federal education budget that's then distributed to the states and it's distributed to schools based on how many children are in the schools, not based on where the schools are. So, so it's true. A, you know, to have that disruption, you need to be able to look outside of, the, you know, what everyone else has been doing for so long. That traditional model adapts and evolves and that's how you get that sweeping change to occur. So that's... Um, and something that you know i don't think unless you would have been brought to your attention i don't think anybody would have thought of so no Uh, yeah and it's you don't like i didn't think about it until i landed here and i was kind of like you know well how come this school gets this and the school gets that or why is there such a disparate um 
a difference mm -hmm. in how in what we have access to um, and why is it that we have so many young people in so much debt at the age of 26 or right. 27 right 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 i mean that's there's so much to unpack there and and as you see our political climate right now the, mm -hmm. imagine that the concept of investing in, in research in your own you know with your own people and here it's it's uh it, people are drawing lines in the sand um, the, you know those that want the free socialist uh education and 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 our system right now where we're like you said kids are graduating with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt so mm -hmm. they're already part of that uh they're behind the eight ball and yeah. and kids now and you know another thing i picked up is that uh entrepreneurship here is uh, oddly enough it's like only recently seems to be being pushed heavily Mm -hmm. uh, although, uh, you know, our, our whole intro, the American dream is all about being resourceful and, and, and Jorge, you know, his parents, uh, were educators, you know, uh, my, my dad owned the business, wasn't a truck driver, but I used to drive a tow truck. So maybe that, that kind of, there's some synergy there. And, uh, and yeah, my, and my dad just, uh, immigrant, you know, my mom and dad are immigrants mm -hmm. and, and, uh, worked in factories and. And, uh, and so we, we really believe in that and empowering and educating and investing. And, and uh, I really, I, we're, we're very fortunate to have you um, here you. at Bennett uh, as a friend, as a client, all, all of the above. We're, we're super fortunate. And like I said before, we're, you know, Jorge and I, we had a chance to tour Bennett Day and, and it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, just from what we saw, and my wife teaches kindergarten and she teaches at a great school. Um, it's a, it's a magnet, science-based magnet school. But she, just what I saw there, the fact that kids were doing music in kindergarten and, and learning Mandarin and, and just the, the, the environment was, was, was very much encouraging creativity and mm -hmm. fostering uh, innovation. And yeah. It's just that. It's really interesting, the notion of entrepreneurship and innovation, for example, because mm -hmm. we often associate entrepreneurship with business. Mm -hmm. And it, whereas actually the entrepreneurial spirit or the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial lens is something that everyone carries in them, right? And, you know, if you're motivated by something, you're interested in something, you're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. However, you know, you, and even with innovation, it's like innovation is not just about coming up with new products it's or new things. It's also new ways of seeing things or doing things. So often we don't put it, entrepreneurship in school, but unless it's a business, to, you know, class or right. it's something up, whereas at Bennett, like you were saying. So Bennett's based on a Reggio Emilia approach to learning, which is out of Italy, and uh, as well as we use the Singaporean approach to mathematics in our school. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very much about learning, you know, different innovative methods and ways from all over the world, right? Um, but is, it's, Ma is Montessori in there at all or no? Not really. It, some people associate Reggio as similar to Montessori, but they're not. They're, they are very different. In Reggio, for example, we very much honor the child as uh, independent and capable in their own learning. So we don't assume that the adult in the room is all knowing and expert. Uh, children bring in their own interests, motives, desires, thinking, knowledge. And so in Reggio, it's very much everyone in the room is learning and we very much lean into uh, the, the conversations our children are having and with each other as well as with us. And that helps build the curriculum. So our curriculum is what we call responsive or emergent curriculum. We actually build it with our children over the course of a trimester and a year. So the children have an active place in, you know, yes, there are certain development goals we need to meet with our children, but we can do that through multiple different ways, um, whether it be through literacies or you know, um, mathematics, it comes into a project, it comes into a conversation and it's the teacher as guide and as facilitator plays a central role in listening and documenting and getting an understanding of where the children are at and how to, um, you know, create experiences with them. So we're very, um, it's a little bit different to Montessori, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's an interesting, very much puts relationships at the heart of learning as well. So, we focus very much on the family. Uh, in the classroom, you'll never find our cl our classes structured where they're all facing the front. There is no front to the room. Uh, every All the tables are either circles or squares mm -hmm. that have a minimum of four seats around them. 
for social and relationship. Um, so everything has that intentionality. Um, we have, uh, you know, instead of having math time and so forth, we have stations in the room which will have, um, say, a lot of loose parts on them that help facilitate mathematical learning. So everything is kind of designed with intentionality, but we like the children to co-lead their learning. So, you know, and, and that's at kindergarten, right? That starts pre-K, right, right. not just when you're in high school. You don't just go, oh, now you're 16 and you can choose what subject you want to do. It's uh, from a very young age, they, they're part of the conversation. So, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I love them being engaged in that part of the conversation and just the whole, something you wouldn't have even thought of. The whole concept of not having the front of the room, of having it be more instead of it being linear now it's literally become spherical in nature it's global and that just that just the way that changes your, your perspective um as a student as a teacher uh you know it's these all all these little details that add up to an experience that's totally different from the model that so many of us so many of us came up learning from mm -hmm. and you know just seeing the re the results that come through that you know they speak for themselves yeah and even it's like when, so I always give this example, Francis Judd, who's a early childhood, um, our test lab teacher, early childhood um, uh, teacher, as well as designer. And uh, she has a background in app development and so, and games, gameplay and game design. Uh, and she introduced the children to app development in her test lab kindergarten, you know, JK <laughs> and kindergarten. Mm -hmm. They worked with a development company out of San Francisco on an app called Osmo Kaleidoscope. And the children weren't just, it's not just tested on them. No, they're part of the development process. And they were, it was wonderful to hear and learn of the stories of how the children spoke with the engineers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and we don't, they're just little people. Yeah. And, and with no yeah. fear at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, no. They'll just oh. tell you like it is. <laughs> yeah. And the way Miss Judd really um, leans in for, to their development and their design and how they see the world is just incredible. And we have many teachers like her. Um, and I always share this story of when we were at the Chicago Twain Game Fair and, and Tangible Play, who's the company, was sharing about Osmo Kaleidoscope in one of the booths. And we were there to support and um, a family walked up to the booth and one of the salespeople turned to the, the son and said, uh, you know, have you ever heard of Osmo? And he went, heard of it. I created it. And it was wow. fantastic. It was this agency. So that the earlier our children can learn that they, they design their world in their words, in their actions, um, and they have agency over their world, it, build, it builds a different kind of capability and confidence. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we really pride ourselves on at our school. So, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Um, one of the things I, I love about Bennett also is that it's you, you guys spend a lot of time making sure that that education is accessible to many different children. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, another reason I really wanted to join Bennett when I learned of them is uh, the real commitment we have both within our enrolled families to grants and scholarships. Um, you know, we very much fundamentally across the leadership team, the board. Uh, we believe that, you know, progressive, because we're regarded as a progressive school and progressive philosophy is actually based on Dewey's learning by doing. And um, it can be very hard for some schools to embrace that given the requirements from state on common core and certain things. So we are very much committed to um, making not just our school accessible through grants and scholarships and who can come to our school, but also how we share what we're learning outside our school with other teachers and other schools, um, as well as with other families who geographically, they might never come to Chicago, so they can never come to our school or um, for whatever reason. And so we, uh, the, the teams established Bennett Labs um, as a way for us to connect with schools and families outside and really share what we're learning, what we're doing. Um, from running professional development for teachers, uh, when our schools were open, we, we had tours um, where and visits from so many different school leaders and teachers who wanted to learn more about project-based learning and how do we structure and design it in our school um, to offering PD and now to offering um, our services to children and families. So we, we very much committed that you, you should be able to get access to project-based learning wherever you are. And you can actually do project-based learning at home. It's not 
something that's just unique to a few, right? It's not, it is actually something that is very accessible. And so that's what we've committed to doing is sharing what we learn uh, with children and families and teachers wherever they are. So let's talk a little bit about how this this project that we're about to launch. Let's let's uh-huh. get right into it. And okay. and, and, and you working with Jorge and Mm-hmm. And that call that I took when you were like, hey, we, we got to launch this thing. I, I was on the road. I think I was I was driving back from Florida and yeah. and we had a short timetable, but you were so enthused uh, about it because obviously, you know, the pandemic has affected education yeah. across the board. Um, my Listen, my wife right now, um, she's trying to, she teaches kindergarten, but she's yeah. got to teach remote learners and in-person learners simultaneously. Yep. It's proving to be very challenging for many. Uh, it's unknown territory. They've, they've, they're winging it. You know, we don't know. So what's what's taking place to migrate this philosophy over into these into yeah. these new solutions? So what was really interesting for us, us like every other school back in February when we started to realize we were going to close, and we closed on the Friday. I think we had three or four days to prepare our teachers and our families. Um and uh, we closed on the Friday. We opened our upper school because high school is very different for obviously digital and online learning uh, than kindergarten and preschool and lower school or elementary as well. So we um, very quickly could migrate our upper school to remote learning. Um, so Friday we closed. Monday, our upper school children were starting to engage in their online wow. classes. Uh, for our kind- for kindergarten and elementary, it's very different. And for us, it was very different. So our philosophy of schooling is very much about hands-on projects, building, creating, you know, whether not, it be, not passive learning, passive oh, learning, not passive. everything is active learning. Right, right. And it's, it's, you're active in your own learning, you're building things, you're creating things. If your project requires that you learn code, then you learn code. If your project requires you get cardboard and masking tape, um, or actually I think you call it masking tape. You are going to be careful with my language sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whatever it needs. And uh, you build prototypes and you learn about this. And So to move our school, a very tangible school, online and digital, was very daunting for all of us. And uh, we, we took three days to, uh, which doesn't sound like much, it wasn't. And we literally went, okay, what's mission critical, right? Uh, what is core that we need to do with that, um, to, uh, whether it be getting our platforms up. We started with um, Google Classroom. We then migrated our younger children to Seesaw because it was more developmentally appropriate. And we really immersed ourselves as teaching faculty, as um, the education team. Everyone immersed themselves in what could this look like? Like how might we actually do Regio project-based learning via the screen when our teachers are at home and our kids are at home um, and you could, when you're at home, you don't have access to what you have in the classroom, be it the teacher or the resources. So we had to really think innovatively. And every time we come up with an idea, we're like, yeah, but what if you don't have that? And what if you don't have that? And what if mom and dad don't have, you know, mm-hmm. so everything was like, let's bring it down to the, 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 not the basics, but what's, what's essential. Um, and one thing that we, we came up with that was essential was the connection between our teachers and our children. So just even getting on for a morning meeting every morning to have a live call and conversation as a class, what does that look like? And so, and as you two know, there's a whole technical infrastructure that's got to be put in place. Yes, Zoom said it's free, but that then created a whole logistical nightmare. Right. So I I, want to ask about, there. obviously there's education with regard to the children as students, but obviously you had to teach the yeah. parents as well. Mm-hmm. So what is that experience like saying, okay, we have to teach our all all of our families how you even interact with this and how that's going to, you know, impact and change everything. And then on the fly, you know, you're yeah. the, we the are time. we were teaching our teachers how to use Zoom as well as teaching our families, which consists of multiple different um types of caregivers, from parents to siblings to grandparents. Um, how to, and if, and they've all got, they might have different devices. So we had some children the first couple of times who would zoom in from an iPhone because they don't have a laptop at home or they didn't have an iPad. Um, And so there was this, and at the same time, we're training our teachers on how to use all the features. And at the time, 
you know, the waiting room that we have now for us is automatic. So in anything in our school, if you want to use Zoom and come onto our meeting, waiting room. But that wasn't in the beginning. In the beginning, right. it was like parents getting on at the same time as children. As you, So there's there's this logistical situation that occurred. And I often talk about, you know, people say, oh, you're flying the plane while you're building it. I say, no, no, no. <laughs> We were building the tarmac and the airport while we're building the plane and also escorting passengers onto the first seat, you know. <laughs> um, so it, it, I see it as, so to me, it's, it's every school innovated in some way. Everyone pivoted and we were forced to. Um, and I wrote an article to my LinkedIn which talks about how K-12 has been the slowest over the last 20 years to move to digital change. Then higher education has moved a lot more quickly. Um, whereas you don't see learning management systems in a lot of schools. You'll see it as, yeah, you can download some articles but or some PowerPoint presentations, but it hasn't been used heavily. Uh, web conferencing, teleconferencing, all that sort of stuff. So there's been this kind of lapse, whereas COVID forced us and to have to step into this space. Um, when, when people talk about teachers and school failing our kids I I always step back from that conversation at first listen and then step back in because I believe our teachers are the most entrepreneurial innovative and creative peoples um yet they don't have the resources that most entrepreneurial innovative and creative people have yeah. so if you take teachers and artists um they're not paid anywhere near like a tech entrepreneur who's founding a new tech business yet look what our teachers did you know across the country across the world they stood up online and digital learning. Was it fantastic in some respects? No, there was a lot of learning with it. Yet, um, so here are peoples that they pivot every day. It's like if you have, you know, 20 kindergarten, 30 kindergarten children that can ask you any question at any time, as well as I need to use a potty. Um, so I think we don't value our teaching teams enough and our schools and our educators enough or pay them enough. Um, we all agree on that. Mm -hmm. So for us as a school, it was really wonderful to see how faculty, our leadership team, we stepped up to deliver online learning. But then what it did for us, <clears throat> as our teams got really comfortable with it and started developing our curriculum in that way, my team in the lab stepped back and went, okay, we're doing this for our families, but what's happening for other families outside? And how could what we're doing really um, be of value to schools, to teachers, and to families? So we created, uh, we called it Bennett Live, and um, we did it in 10 days. So <laughs> I didn't sleep. That's I didn't insane. Talk That's about insane. it. It's totally insane. Totally. Like the, the time that it takes, you know, we, we talk about projects mm -hmm. and how we manage them, you know, in, in the web development circle and then but having to do all the programming to have to get all those moving parts moving simultaneously it's a testament to uh you know to, to the efforts that that's been pulled in by everybody you know what a group effort to be able to put all the gears into place have it turn and create such a high quality product too well we it was really interesting because we were seeing in our classrooms our teachers were creating videos and all sorts of different activities for our children that if they couldn't get on Zoom, they could still watch the video and do the activity at home or what have you, or still participate in some way. So we looked at that and we were like, okay, that's been created for our families. And it has, there's often identifiable information. So the teachers would be, would mention the children's names and so forth in them. And so what we did in, in my department, we then took that model and went, okay, how do we bespoke design episodes? So just like Netflix, you get on, there's a series, you know, there's different episodes on different things. And uh, how do we design that so that we have tangible play? Every episode you're working on a project physically. Um, you have, um, it's not directed by a teacher on the screen, it's guided. Mm -hmm. So the teacher, do you ever remember the choose your own adventure books? Oh yeah. I love those. Oh yeah. I love that. Right? So it's kind of like that. So the, t the, the teacher guide on the screen is saying, well, you could do it this way or you could do it that way. Mm -hmm. So everyone's projects at home are going to end up to be different because it depends what you choose. So trying to put choice into it, because unfortunately with online learning, often children don't have a choice. They get right. given slides, they get given materials. They one get size given fits all. Yeah. Totally. And so we were trying to innovate that way. We, um, I hired uh, two of our founding teachers who no longer are at Bennett. They're ones in Colorado, ones in West Illinois. And 
um, and they were up for the challenge. And so we said, okay, let's create. We created a creative play with Mrs. Cunningham and uh, exploring with Mr. Reynolds. And uh, we fitted out a room in each of their houses. I think Miss, Miss Cunningham actually had a little nook in one bedroom that she was using because that's the other thing. You're now seen into teachers' homes and you're seen, um, there's a real privacy element that comes along to this. So we were very conscious of creating an environment that was in keeping with our school but was at home. And uh, Mr. Reynolds created a little workshop in his spare bedroom and, uh, you know, and it was a way to just every day they created an episode and um, we'd have each week would have a theme. So it'd be colour. Let's this week just explore colour or this week let's explore, you know, Mr. Reynolds did a whole week on design thinking and, well, what is that? And his series was for seven to 12-year-olds and Mrs. Cunningham it was three to six-year-olds and, um we, the production schedule, I set it and I, afterwards I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> we produced two videos, two videos a day, five days a week for nine weeks. And, uh, it that's, was, that's what blew me away when you said how many episodes you created in, in, in such a short span of time. It was yeah. just, we, crazy. we got into a cycle and we were like, actually this works and we minimized product post-production. So it was like, actually and, and I've spoken to a number of videographers and editors and people who've wanted to get involved and they're like, well, if I take my camera and go to their home and I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to work uh, because not only does it increase the production price and cost, uh, there's a danger of COVID because of social distancing if camera people are going to our teachers' homes to film, but also there's a, a delay in getting getting the episode to the families, right? Mm-hmm. So. Whereas what we did, um, Mr. Reynolds did it all through Facebook Live. He li- we literally went live on Facebook every day and we would uh, download the recording so we had it archived. And Mrs. Cunningham did hers pre-produced because she has a young family at home, so she had to do it at certain times when the children were sleeping or napping. Um, and it was wonderful. We got a great reception and we put it out free on YouTube and on Facebook um, to families and you could, yeah, you turn up, you could watch it whenever you wanted to because clearly it's archived. Um, and we just created this series of Ben Alive, these two different series. And then I started to get inquiries from other teachers that they'd want to create a series. And I was like, okay, mm. what does this look like if we, mm-hmm. we grow this? Mm-hmm. Uh, and as opposed to having two contributors that are creating 44 episodes each, what does it look like to have 30 contributors creating eight episodes each? So that then I flipped the model. And so we had more variety in terms of, um, and we, we don't, it's not about English, math, science, French. So that our school doesn't, we do not have subjects because we believe that um, in integrated learning where a project has a bit of every kind of subject in it, has some science, has some math, and that's how we live. So we did, we've got visual storytelling, exploring sound, um, outdoor adventuring. Now that outdoor adventuring was fantastic. The first episode, Miss Faraday was climbing trees <laughs> and, uh, you know, exploring trees and, and, and it's, so we really opened it up. We had Mr. G who, um, he is, he's got a background in architecture and design. So he explored Chicago architecture. He took a camera and he went wandering and he, he would go to a different, um, architectural, you know, masterpiece here in Chicago and you'd tell the children about it and he would then talk to them about how you draw and how you do architectural drawings. So each episode is a little bit different and um, we had a great team uh, that we were able to cut the videos relatively easily. We tried to make it very easy for our teachers. Mm. So I wanted them to focus on the learning, not all the technical side. So they delivered for us. I said, you know, film yourself for five minutes and then move on, film yourself for another five and we'll cut it together. And so we kind of developed a recipe. It's not a worksheet. It's not a cheat sheet. It's just a recipe. And it's every series is a little bit different. Um, and that our teachers love that. I love that for our listeners too. It's just a great example of something that we always preach, which is just, just get out there, get live. Yep. And then you can make the adjustments and you I, like just listen to you explain it. You said we have this literal emergency situation that's happening. Mm-hmm. We need to innovate a solution now. 
Then you said, how do we scale this? Because having two content creators making these many pieces of content doesn't scale very well. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that instead? And you did that, you know what I mean? And, but you were already, you'd already released episodes. So it wasn't that you waited for it to be perfect did it all and then put that up you built the recipe by doing so following you know, what you're what, what you're teaching the children on top of that and then as an, as you know it's the whole entrepreneurial spirit innovative spirit hey let's get this up let's get this into the world and then we can refine it as we go there's a there's a really famous example um uh new york ballet and uh i so many years ago i did work with a theater company in the uk and I met their artistic director and they were founding a new national theater in the country of Wales, it was government funded. And they, and he, I met him through some people and he was like fascinated by Twitter and social media. And he was like, how could we start a theater company with a Twitter account and a Facebook account, not with a production? And I'm like, what? Like, Hang, hang on a minute, you're a theater company. So surely you want to put on a stage performance. And he's like, no, no, no. Every place is a stage. He goes, you can do theater in the park. You can do theater in a bar. You can do theater in a classroom. He said, he goes, but how do we do it on digital platforms? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So one thing I learned from him was about how theater companies and artists were experimenting with digital. And I came across the New York Ballet were, they've got a marketing department. Mm -hmm. And um, they were having certain, you know, like most arts organizations, you know, selling tickets and new productions and so forth. And they had a new marketing executive who joined their team who was actually a background in journalism. And they totally changed the design of their marketing department, moved away from traditional marketing philosophy and adopted a journalism philosophy. And they documented everything, whether they knew what they wanted it for or not. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they had the ballet dancers at rehearsals wearing GoPros on their heads just to get footage. And they literally, I'll have to send it to you, they, they totally changed the mindset in the department of being one of, we, we're just documenting the story of the New York Ballet and whatever we need it for. And so then they have all this content they can then, and a theme comes out of the content and of how they share it. So that's a philosophy that I lean to as well. It's like create and then you can edit and play, right? It's like in our schools, there are so many opportunities to document learning and then share that learning. Um, but if we don't document it, you don't have it to share. So yeah. it's changing that mindset. Whereas most marketers, it's like, got to have a strategy, got to have some objectives, who's our target audience, and they have a plan before they get the content. And then they go out and try and create the content, like get actors and da-da-da. And I'm like, no, you got a whole like, community. Yeah, life is the content. <laughs> life is the content. So <laughs> document, like, you know, just the other day we, we'd, um, we've created Bennett Live bags that children get when they do our pods and stuff, and we, get, we gifted them to our faculty. Well, we, we documented putting the bags together. You know, it's like we documented the process, you know, well, Hey, I do have photos of us on zoom. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, I mean, Hey, that's that <laughs> like be building a website, but, but, but I love that. And you, process. you, process. you tied into this thing that is so huge right now, especially amongst, oh, we talk about social media and content creators. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who hire, especially in the content creation space, who hire assistants that they thought were going to be there to, you know, to say, hey, let's we need to schedule meetings and this, that, the other thing. And they have hired them specifically just to do behind the scenes yep. filming because it's that element, it's that documenting and mm -hmm. just the popularity of documentaries in general that are, that are so interesting. People love to see the nuts and bolts behind the whole thing. They love to pull the veil behind and see how it all came together. So it's fascinating that the thing that you're going to do anyway is the show. Yeah, and it's, it's authentic. It. So, right. you know, I just exactly. I finished the frequently asked questions on our website right this morning. And uh, I've got a question in there, which was, and we did get this on Facebook. It was like, uh, the sound quality is not the best on one of your episodes. And I'm like, yeah, it was filmed with an iPhone in a windy day <laughs> down near Lake Michigan. And it's, it's, so it's recognized, it's authentic. And it's not, it doesn't have to be high produced perfect. Just be real, like be real. And our teachers are real. They're in their homes. They're in their back gardens. They're in their cities or towns where they live. And they're sharing what they love. And that is the heart of learning. It, you know, you don't need castles and big camp. Like I, 
you know, when COVID hit, I'm like, learning is not a campus. Mm -hmm. Learning is a process. We can learn anywhere. We just need to let go of the need to be physically on a campus. Like before huge school districts in America, you had neighbourhood schools, community neighbourhood schools where children would go, there'd be no maximum than maybe 80 to 100 kids in a school. And the teacher lived in the community. You could walk to school. There's no need for school buses because (laughs) it was community schools. And so when COVID for me hit, I'm like, hmm, maybe, you know, because large school districts of four and 5,000, they're the ones that have struggled the most with COVID and having to roll out a digital strategy or an innovation strategy for their school across so many families, you know. Um, So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate for smaller schools. And, uh, you know, it's all about relationships and development and, and so forth. Um, but, yeah, so. But Bennett Live, yeah, and thank you to you, both of you, because we, we did. We, I, I think we finished, I was in the middle of finishing off the summer production, so we then had 240 episodes of content, which we were cleaning up. And by that I mean we got it into the world, but we wanted to create an app and a platform so that you had it in your hands Um, because another feedback we got is families didn't necessarily want their children on YouTube or Facebook. And so I was like, okay, let's build a platform. So, you know, we hired another company called Build Fire who are an app development company to work with us because it's a content app, right? It just delivers video content or class content. Um, And then I reached out to you and went, we need a website because you know, um, we were drowning out our school too, because it was <laughs> all about Bennett Live when Bennett Day School, you know, has a great curriculum and a great uh, physical experience. Um, and so, yeah, so I reached out to you to build, you know, and it, it, we want families to come to our site and feel the joy and the creativity and the fun and learning is built within that, right? So, um, so thank you to you because you were like, okay, Kelly, your time scale is probably not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? I hit you up on a Monday and I want it done by Friday, probably. Something like that. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, does this? Um, because I want to give you a chance to share about mm-hmm. how families can find out about it. When is you know we'll talk about when it goes live. But yep. does this expand now? Because like, I think we all are looking for the silver lining in all of this. Yeah. Does this really? Is this going to help? spread the ministry of the philosophy at Bennett even to even more families? Well, I think what it's going to spread is um, we, we've we developed, I believe, something that families can use at home um, that has been developed by uh, an amazing team of educators, teachers, um, that's very hands-on and project-based. So it can be used um, in uh, amongst your existing learning. So if you're doing remote learning at your school, you know, and you want to learn a little bit about um, uh, film. For example, we have a film design challenge that's part of uh, the catalogue. You can get on and you can actually uh, complete the challenge and learn about film. If you're a teacher at a school and you have some children who are at home learning because they're being quarantined, you know, they can download and do some of the series. So you could ask them to complete some of Exploring with Mr. Reynolds. Um, So we see it as something that supplements uh, uh, whatever your learning is for our school, we do this every day. It is our curriculum yet. We know that that's not the case for every school. So we've developed it really to support teachers as well in, um, here is very deep, um, project-based learning, um, experiences that you can share with your school or your children, but it's also for families at home. Um, you know, to break away from, so the other thing is healthy screen time. There's this, belief that so we are exposed to screens and we look at screens all the time and yes there is um guidance that children shouldn't have more than a certain hour or a certain amount of time on a screen i go deeper and go actually what are they doing with the screen is it passive are they just looking at it and watching a movie then yeah they shouldn't have more than maybe an hour a week if they're in kindergarten on passive learning Mm -hmm. but is it active learning? Now, active learning is learning around a screen, right? So I don't know how many families have engaged in aerobics via the screen or exercises via the screen during COVID. That's active learning, but it's not at the screen, it's around it. And so our projects are the same. You are building with your hands, you're working, so you're not always just engaged with what's going on. So really understanding what healthy screen time means 
um, and how do you build it in? So we wanted to build a product or an offering where families can have some confidence that if their children are on Bennett Live, they're actually physically doing something. They're not just sat there watching or flipping a screen or tapping a box. It's actually they're listening to, you know, the teacher guide and building something physical. Uh, chances are they might come out and go, mum and dad or grandma, you know, I need this. Where is this? <laughs> you know, or they'll pull apart your kitchen cupboards trying to find the oldest Tupperware container they can because they build a boat that floats, right? So um, but we there are resource guides as well that parents and caregivers can download. So if they're doing an episode, you can get an idea of what they're going to need. Um, but we're trying to make it so that if it's home learning, it can be a support. If it is... And you can do it as a family or you can do it individually. It depends on where you're at, yeah. Um, But we have had teachers use it, which that was not our intended, you know, group of people we wanted to share with, but it's been wonderful. You know, um, one teacher reached out to me and was like, do you mind if I have our class do Exploring Sound with Mr. Vinny? And I'm like, oh, no, that's fantastic. Tell me how it goes. You know, how much, you know. And is there a fee for them to use it or? So all our episodes are available free on YouTube. Uh, You can watch them on YouTube and so forth. On the app, we've organized it. So it's a little bit easier to find things. And there's also other resources. So there's resource guides, there's book lists, there's other things that you can get. Um, The app, there is a fee to download um, because that helps us pay for our app and obviously our Mm -hmm. website. Um, But yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a quite a, I think we've I think we've done well in COVID. We've been very productive. Excellent, excellent. And by the time this airs, it will be live. So, do you want to share where where our listeners yeah. might be able to check you out? Yeah, certainly. So, on behalf of myself and Jorge, who have worked really hard, <laughs> we're going to bring you. Uh, you can go to BennettLive.com and uh, you can find everything about the media series, the le- home learning pods that we have for early childhood, as well as live classes. Uh, we also have self-placed challenges that teens can do uh, in, you know, social leadership, film and social and, and tabletop game design and so forth. But yeah, bennerlive.com is where you go. You can also Google us. We were featured in Good Housekeeping. We are featured in NBC did a, p- a piece on us because we had at the Planetarium joined us for a, a section on stars. Um, but yeah, bennerlive.com. And if you Google us, you'll come across where we are on YouTube, on Facebook <clears throat> and on Instagram. So Excellent. Yeah. I listen. I without going on a tangent, I, I believe that this was all preordained. That you you came here. You, you know, you were already part of Bennett when this all hit, and now this is born, mm-hmm. and this is just amazing. And I, and I think everyone is so fortunate to have you at Bennett. Um, I do want to give you a chance to, as we close, to give some parting words to our entrepreneurs out there, some inspiration or a bit of wisdom. Um, and how they may use this social design that you're so uh, yeah. well versed in as part of their business strategy or to improve their existing business. Yeah. So a key thing about social design is um, actually listening and paying attention to what's going on in the environment around you and around your business. Uh, sometimes you can get really locked into your product, your offering, your business, your community, your customers. Um, it's really important to listen to what is trending and what is going on in the world as well as the community, your own community. So um, we often talk a lot and don't listen a lot, right? So from a very young age, we're socialized to speak and not so much to hear and listen. So I spend a lot of time documenting, um, making notes, and it can be anything from what's going on on social media to what's going on in my school um, and so forth to really start to pick up trends. Um, There's a number of uh, publications you can also, so there's trend reports, there's um, uh, Fast Company is a really great one as well, or different magazine and organizations to follow for trends. So, and social design is about designing to be social. And that's a combination of things. It's social impact. um, It's being social as people. So what can bring people together? when I was working with some startups, I really was trying to get them not to focus on their product so much and focus on their people, right? Because your teams share your product, your community of customers, you know, they use and share your product. So it's more about the people than it is the actual product. 
So um, to be social, um, you know, it's really important to really think in that space. How are you bringing people together? How does your offering, your service enable that? How does your website um, don't just push content. You know, we have so many digital tools nowadays where we can just push notifications. Uh, Like even on the app that we developed, you know, I was looking at some stuff and they said to me about, oh, you can push notifications. And I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. But it's not social, right? It's like me barging into your house and sitting down to watch television and you haven't invited me, right? (laughs) It's like, it's, so there's, there's certain, (laughs) there's certain ways. The other thing, the third thing I want to, sort of mention around Mm -hmm. social design. Um, It's when you think about how we design for the world, social impact and being social, um, listen to your kids, listen to younger generations. Mm -hmm. They get it. They're doing it. They live it. They've grown up in this world. Um, And it, while you might not understand what they're sharing or how they're sharing, um, it's really important. And to also listen to what they care about. Um, so I learn a lot and that's why I'm in schools. Mm. I learn a lot from our children. I learn a lot from teenagers. Um, and, uh, I think it's really, really important generation that we pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for all those gems. Dr. Kelly Page, you've been amazing. It's been a great conversation. Um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to this launch. You got, you want to say something else? Let's go. Yeah. I want to ask a question. I want to ask you okay. two a question. All right. Oh, sure. So if I throw it back to you, if I throw it back to you two, what has COVID and this whole experience, what has it taught you two around how we design and how digital has a, such a huge impact on our world? So, so for, for us, you know, there's been so yeah. much with adapting to, to, you know, to working remotely, to working um, around, you know, as a developers, we try to, we find workarounds for things all the time. So it ca- kind of took that same mindset of how do we get to the end goal? You know, if we, we can't go this way, how do we, you know, how might we go uh, over or under instead of through? And I, I've learned so much about how to change and how to adapt, how to be more open to, uh, to evolving quicker, you know, oftentimes it says, Hey, maybe if we take this practice and modify it, you know, and that'll be something we put on the board and that comes into play six, eight, 12 months down the line and being able to take that and act more quickly. And it has produced so much great results. We were able to change so many bottlenecks in our processes that we might not have had it not been Mm. the necessity that COVID brought upon us. Mm. Um, So being open to, like you said, uh, a lot of it too is listening, listening to your clients, listening to your team members. Um, And I also just wanted to shout out the team. You know, I I lead the web team, but it's certainly not just me. So much of them, so much of what this and Bennett Live product was, is an effort of everyone back in technology, front end design, UI, UX. So I just want to make sure that they they get their little shout out. But um, yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, it, it became the necessity and being open and to be adaptable um just proves i think for digital in what we're going through now and in general i think we've learned so much more that even when we're done with this we can take those same lessons and apply them going forward yeah i think for for me since i I agree with everything jorge said i've I've taken myself out of the way uh in some instances and opened up uh some of our you know processes to become more efficient but i have as a leader I've never been more emotionally in tune with the entire team, like every single person. Mm-hmm. I've always cared about them deeply, but now it's it, all of our emotions are heightened. Um, it's it's become much more of a personal uh, experience. Um, I, I've I've got to know what's going on in their home life it's, it, and how it affects their work life a lot more mm-hmm. during COVID than I think before COVID. And I hope that that doesn't go away because it's really really brought us closer. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, one of the first things that I did was get to get ourselves out of our own fears. Cause that first zoom meeting, when this all hit, we were all like deer in the headlights. Mm-hmm. Everybody was like, okay, what do we do? And, you know, I had a moment of grace where it was, we're just going to help people. You know, it's, that's always been our mission. We're just going to help people even more. We're going to put out tutorials. We're going to show people how to do things. Mm-hmm. We're going to put out content that's inspirational. And we just really threw ourselves into helping others. And that 
kind of gave us all a sigh of relief because we were no longer thinking about ourselves as much. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I hope that also stays. So I, I, we're always looking for the silver lining. Um, and, um, you know, working with, working with clients like you is, has been amazing during this time because it's, if I always, I always repeat this, it's the trifecta. It's like, if we can, if we can use our powers for good, you know, do what we love and make a good living, then, then it's, that's the Holy grail, you know, for us. (laughs) And it's wonderful to hear that because I think you, you helped us in an incredible way. Um, and you helping other people and listening to your people is, Mm -hmm. so we've, done huge listening to our faculty um, mm-hmm. and our our community and our families. And like you're seeing into homes, you know, we've mm-hmm. got teachers seeing into homes that they've never seen into before, mm-hmm. you know. So, Testament, thank you for everything you've done for us. I have to do a shout out for Peralta Design because, you know, you've worked with us on our Bennett Day School website, our Upper School website, and now with this launch of Bennett Live, and I know it's just the beginning because this is truly uh, a digital platform so that, families, you know, and children everywhere can get access to project-based learning with, you know, no matter where you are. That's the whole point. Um, COVID has taught me how important it is for makers and creators, you know, uh, to really step up. So thank you both of you for everything you've done for us at Bennett. Um, We are really indebted to you and I can't wait to, it's going to be live. I know. It's It's exciting. It's exciting. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Jorge. This has been amazing. We've got we've had a great show. Uh, we we just love working with you and how it aligns with with our mission. So uh, we're going to conclude this show. Thank you everyone for listening uh, to this episode of Mission Control. Until next time, this is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design and Relaunch Brands. Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew 